Uh, I want to talk about something that's going to tick all of you off. Uh, I often say I'm an equal opportunity offender, and this passage is definitely going to make every single person in our church furious. And then when I explain it, you'll be like, oh yeah, that makes sense. So let's go ahead and let's jump into the passage. We're continuing our series called Fight to the Finish, and the passage we're looking at today starts in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13. It says, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we may die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner spirit. The unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands like Sarah who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life, so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Now, if you're any thinking person, you're thinking, what the heck? What, what in the world is going on there? And men, hello, men, you get off scot-free in that right? Slaves and women, but then men are like, oh, blah, 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 and I totally get it. Let's start by looking at the context. Uh, the first thing this passage says is that Christians are to submit to every human authority. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, to the emperor, but then governors that were uh, placed all throughout regions. If you remember the very first week, we talked about the governor Pliny, who wrote to the emperor and said, what am I supposed to do with these Christians? I don't know what to do. I persecuted a few of them, and all I got out of them was they believe in some superstition. What do you want me to do? 
And Peter says, I want you to submit to them. And the reason that I want you to submit to them, and let me just, we'll get to that in a second. The word submit comes from the Greek word hupotasso, which meant to place oneself under one's control. So it meant exactly what you think it means. Peter is asking Christians in ancient Turkey who are being persecuted to submit to the human authorities that are above them. And they're like, we're like, what the heck? Why would you do that? Like in our country, what we do is that when we are going through unjust persecution, what we do is we organize a protest. Makes me think of a meme this week that I saw. Doctors are protesting and no one knows why. <laughs> I love that, right? Uh, uh, like, like in our country, like you protest, you get news coverage, you start using a hashtag, and then everybody sees uh, what the person, that people are doing wrong. And in the first century, what Peter said, Christians must submit to every human authority. And the reason is they had no other recourse, Right? They had no other recourse. They didn't have power. If Christians started to protest in the first century, they would send in the Roman army and crucify everyone. Like they didn't have rights. They didn't live in a republic like we do. Now, why were they supposed to do this? They were supposed to do this because for it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Now, um, did you have a, um, a nickname when you were younger or when you were going to school? I want you to lean over to the person next to you and I want you to share what your nickname is. Go ahead, let's do that. Those of you at home, just share the nickname that people called you uh, when you were a kid. All right? I would share my nickname, but I'm still in therapy for it, so okay? But what I wanna do is I wanna show you a picture. Can you see this picture right here? This is your outreach pastor, Dan Reichel. Whenever I travel with Dan, this is us when we were traveling in Africa. I kid you not, in a plane, in a car, on a bus, like literally within seconds, bam, he's out like a light. Now, what nickname would you give him? Give me some nicknames here, right? Bad what? Bad breath. Okay, bad breath? Did I, I, okay, all right. Sleeping beauty, uh, hashtag much sleep. Uh, you probably think of some good ones. Now, you, 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 you have a picture, and you know Dan, so that would give you the ability to make a um, nickname for him, but in the first century, people didn't go to church services that were meeting in homes. They didn't see it. So what they did is that they heard from second and third and fourth hand that in these church meetings, there was cannibalism and that they were atheists and they were involved in group sex. Why? Because Cannibalism, you're right, they're gonna eat, eat my body, right? Atheism, there's but one God, so they didn't believe in all of the other gods. And why did they, they believe, why was there a rumor that there were Christians when they met that they had sex with one another? Because they were told to love one another unconditionally, right? And so Peter says, if we're gonna stop the persecution, we have no wherewithal. We don't live in the kind of society where we can engage in protest, the only option that we have is to submit to every authority, but to also do good to them. For those of you who are watching around the country or around the world, um, we have a state highway right out in front of our church building called Highway 422. And uh, obviously you've seen the construction that's going on at 422. This past week, there was a guy that we're, I went to the grocery store, Wegmans, and then I'm driving home. And as I'm driving home, this guy comes flying behind me, no joke, easily 100 miles an hour. It was ridiculous. Flew in front of me, went over here and went to the side, and then I, 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 I'm surprised he didn't die. But the Lord knew what he was doing because eventually the traffic slowed down. 
And as it was slowing down, he was on the left-hand side and I was on the right-hand side. And he needed me to let him into traffic in front of me. And what do you think I did? Did I let him in? Of course not. I flipped him off. I cussed him out. I did all kinds. Of course, no. I went, right? And I, and I let him in. I Trust me, I did not want to do that. I did not want to do that at all. In the Christians in the first century, what Peter is saying is that when you're in a situation where you have the opportunity to do good to someone, you ought to do good because then it makes the person think, well, why would they do that? Especially if someone is a governing authority. In our culture, our governing authorities are the police, uh, the president, our governor, like we couldn't meet forever because our governor put very strict mandates out. And so what the first century people did is that they had no recourse, but they still were supposed to submit to those people. Now, so the apostle Peter gives three situations. The first situation is for slaves. Slaves in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to them, our masters. When we read that, in the 21st century, we're like, this is, this is the worst possible thing. This is an endorsement of slavery. And it is the exact opposite of an endorsement of slavery. In the first century, 50% of people living in Rome were slaves. Half of Rome, slaves. It's because slaves were considered part of the household unit. People captured in war were turned into slaves. People often sold themselves into slavery to pay off a debt. Oftentimes, slaves were the most educated people in the family. Slavery wasn't based on skin color like the Atlantic slave trade. Slaves ran businesses, they negotiated deals, and people could earn their freedom. Many biblical scholars believe that the Apostle Paul's family lived in northern Israel and was uh, essentially moved as slaves to Tarsus in Turkey where they earned their freedom. And so slavery was a very common thing. The Apostle Paul, when he wrote the, the letters to Ephesians and Colossians, he addressed the household unit. And so he talked to, to fathers, he talked to wives, he talked to kids, and he talked to slaves. 50% of the people at least, in the churches that the Apostle Peter was writing to, were slaves. Now, it's different than how it happened here in our country and in the Caribbean, but it still was evil. So anybody that reads that is thinking, how could the biblical writer not call for the end of slavery? Now, the Apostle Paul did call for the end of slavery. He said, were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you, although if you can gain your freedom, do so. By all means, do so. But the reason that Peter asked slaves to submit to their masters and to do good to them is because what other option did they have? They didn't have the ability to change anything. If they protested, they all get killed. So what Peter encouraged them to do was change their hearts one person at a time. And so when their master asked them to do th something, rather than talking back, they did it. They did it with a positive attitude. Rather than turning around and trying to kill their master, he served them faithfully. So that when the master asked, what, why is it that you're different? Well, I'm a Christian. And they said, oh, aren't, aren't you the people who are basically cannibals and atheists and have group sex together in your meetings? And he's like, I think you see by my behavior alone that we're not those kinds of people. And so the behavior of a Christian slave doing good to his master would silence the foolish talk of a master open him or her up to the gospel and eventually create a brother and sister in Christ where they were equals. Obviously, the biblical writers believed that slavery was an evil institution, but how you go about tackling it in the first century 
It was fundamentally different than the way we do it today. Now the other thing is, what about women? Wives, submit to your husbands. Now that actually is true. Wives are supposed to submit to their husbands because husbands are the best. And, no, I'm just kidding. Now, again, when it comes to wives, it's the same scenario. Look up on the screen with me. In the first century, there were people that had power. The people in power in the first century were civil authorities, slave owners, and husbands. And those without power were slaves and women. Slaves and women were considered property. In the first century, Roman um, men that were heads of families were considered the pater familias, the head of the Roman th family, and they had autocratic control. They owned the estate, and the estate included land, animals, and people. If you were a slave, you were property. If you were his kid, you were property. That, that in the first century, if someone had a young girl, and if the, the pater familias said, take it out to the countryside and feed it to the animals, they would just leave it out on the countryside. The Christians were the one that would go and scoop up the little girls and raise them. And if you were his wife, you were property too. Now, just like slaves, what recourse would you have if you were married to someone and legally and culturally, they had total control over you? How would you change that? Like, um, I want you to imagine those of you who are husbands or those of you who are boyfriends or fiancés, I want you to imagine that your wife or your fiancé or your girlfriend joined a secret religion. And when she asked you what went on there, she said, oh, not much, We're just, we just believe in Jesus. But you heard that they have group sex there and they're atheists and they're cannibals. You'd be like, you're not going there. And so the only way that wives could, and the reason the apostle Peter is writing this, because he's talking about wives that are married to non-Christians, right? Wives in the same way, submit your wives to your husbands. So if any of them do not believe in the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. And so what he's saying is, is that just like slaves, you wives have no rights. So what you're going to do is you're going to submit to your husbands and you're going to do good to them. And in the process, it's going to silence the ignorant talk of foolish husbands and it's going to open them up to the gospel. Here's my question. Would you be willing to do that today? Would you be willing to do good to someone today, even if they treated you poorly, so that they could go to heaven? Like, if you don't believe in heaven and hell, and if you don't believe non-Christians go there, this does not make any sense. But if you believe that you must become a Christian in order to go to heaven, you would be willing to submit and you would be willing to do good in the first century, even if someone is treating you poorly. Now, the Christian idea of a marriage is two co-equals fully equal in every way, where they both submit to one another. But what happens in the first century when you're married to a non-Christian and the non-Christian husband is the pater familias and has total control? What recourse do you have? You can murder him. Or you can submit and do good and change their heart. And that's what Peter is saying. You know, from American history, we know that you don't beat bullies by out-bullying the bully. Just ask Sheriff Jim Clark, who on March 7, 1965, unleashed dogs, tear gas, and clubs 
against 600 protesters on the Edmund Pettus Bridge on the outskirts of Selma, Alabama, all while televised on TV. The Christian rights movement, or the civil rights movement, at its heart, a Christian movement, following the example of Jesus, did not win through a display of power, but by shining a light onto the bullies and allowing the world to watch who and what they really are. Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. Why? Because you never outbully the bullies. You outsubmit to the bullies in love and strength with the eyes of others on you and the overwhelming power of the populace watching this as their hearts are changed and the hearts of doing this are changed. People stand up and overpower the bully for you. And sometimes the bully's heart changes, as in the case of the book of Philemon. In the New Testament, there's a one-chapter book called the book of Philemon. Onesimus was a slave that the apostle Paul met. And the book of Philemon is a letter that is written to a slave owner who's in the end, whose heart was changed by the example of Onesimus submitting to Philemon, the master owner, the master, the slave owner, and by Onesimus doing good, Philemon turned around and let him go. That's what this is talking about. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that in our community, that regardless of gender, race, socioeconomic position, we are all equals, equals at the foot of the cross. But when it comes to reaching our non-Christian friends, knowing that heaven and hell hangs in the balance, just like you asked us, Jesus, to not resist an evil person Father, help us to show kindness and to do good to those under whom we are there under their authority, whether they're police officers, teachers. Many kids are here under the authority of their parents. Governors, mayors, the president. As your disciples, help us to resist through submitting and doing good in the process, changing their heart. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching today's message. Make sure to check out Brian's new book, Finding Favor, God's Blessings Beyond Health, Wealth, and Happiness. To sign up for Brian's newsletter, please go to Brian's website at brianjones.com.